Welcome to the Great Beer State podcast from the Michigan Brewers Guild. The Great Beer State is a weekly show sharing conversations and stories from the passionate people who contribute to our vibrant Michigan beer community. It is made up of a mix between full-length archived interviews from the Guild's first documentary book project, A Rising Tide, Stories from the Michigan Brewers Guild, and conversations recorded in the here and now. Each episode is kicked off with a conversational update from host Scott Graham, Executive Director of the Guild, and the Brevangelist Fred Biltman, author of A Rising Tide. Here's Scott and Fred. Welcome to Michigan's Great Beer State Podcast. My name's Fred, the Beer Evangelist. I'm here with my good friend, Scott Graham, Executive Director for the Michigan Brewers Guild. Scott, how are you doing this fine day? I'm doing very well, Fred. Uh, glad to be here and uh, working on episode 24, 25. I think, we're, 20, I think we're 26. 26, we're, uh, excellent. Yeah, we've got a... Uh, half a year in uh, of weekly podcasts. And we're going to be talking to Mitch, who's a co-founder of Speciation Artisan Ales in Comstock Park, Michigan and Grand Rapids uh, in a bit. Uh, but first we'll do some updates and we'll go through our Brewers Dozen shout outs. Uh, what's new in the, in the big world of uh, life in the COVID uh, world with uh, breweries and brew pub members? Well, there has been kind of a new development. Um, We are seeing COVID cases increase. Um, I don't want to get into a big bunch of statistics, but I think the number of cases is as high as it's been or it's it's higher than it was in the spring. Um, I think that deaths and hospitalizations maybe are down, although of course regionally it's different depending on where you go. And, And we're living now with um, guidelines and emergency orders from Department of Health and Human Services rather than the governor's office. But one new one was has to do with contact tracing efforts. And it says that anybody that goes to a dine-in food service establishment and dines in, um, that establishment has to collect their name and phone number excuse me, in the time and date that they were there. And uh, it was, there was a little bit of confusion, but I think it, to me, it's clear that a, even a brewery tasting room with no food, it, if you sell food and beverage, you, you're a food service establishment, if you sell food or beverage. And if somebody has it at the place, as opposed to takeout, that's dine in, even though it's drinking in. So there was some confusion about that. I, I think it really does apply to um, a tasting room. And there's certainly concern, right? I've, I've talked to different people about their approach of how to collect this information. And, you know, I, I've had people say, look, I, I, I know that I've lost customers for life because we said you have to wear a face covering when you come in here and they were mad and and left or wouldn't come in and we're just plain mad and we've talked about this type of thing and there was more concern about geez now I need to get your name and phone number and record the time it seems kind of onerous when really if you make a reservation you leave that information if you use your credit credit or debit card you're leaving your name it's not that much of a stretch when you look at the actual example, but I can also relate to people saying, I, you know, that feels intrusive. I, all I want to do is come and give you some money and have a beer and go about my own way. I really don't want to like be tracked as far as where I'm going and what I'm doing. So it, again, it gets back to, these are challenging times. It can be frustrating in a lot of ways and it's certainly um, a hard hard little curveballs that are, are coming at folks that they have to deal with and and manage. So one more thing. One more thing, and that's a big one. I think that you have the issue itself um, of, okay, I don't think anyone was, any one of us could have imagined in 2019 saying, well, I'll bet there'll be this thing that requires everybody to leave their name and number in the time they are in a dining hall because of a contagious disease. Uh, it seems fictional in a lot of ways and just outlandish, but here we are, we're in it. And so I think it will also probably um, 
you know, we're heading into the winter months. The dine-in uh, is going to be, there's only indoors, even though this rule applies to outdoors too, I think. Um, we're heading indoors where all of this, the stakes get higher. And um, so I think we're going to see some people uh, focusing on carry out to go, um, you know, shifting into that to go model that we saw in the earlier days of when we, um, in the earlier days of the pandemic and different things. So um, I don't know. I think, I think my personal view is just to keep encouraging people to be nice, be cooperative. Um, and, and the breweries, the restaurants, everybody's just trying to follow the rules and find a way to feed you and serve you beer. So best we can do to make their job easy is what's right. It also got me thinking about uh, my own self. And I think what I'd encourage listeners to do is I think we should be making plans more for how we're going to get our beer. Who are we going to support? How are we going to get our food? I think that, um, you know, breweries and brew pubs, they are going to need their customer support from their community now more than ever. So think about how are you shopping and can you make a weekly stop and, uh, develop some routines for winter so that um, so that everybody feels your support. You're well stocked with what you need to make it through and we can get through this together. Yeah. And I think that um, you're getting at an underlying point and that is that, um, and, and I'm not saying that we're going to live in a new normal. I'm sorry to spit those words out, but the fact is, um, consumer habits and expectations and all these other little elements around things that we've been used to are evolving and changing and it's going to um, force breweries and they're already doing this to reevaluate what they're doing and how they're doing and take new and different approaches and they just like consumer preferences might go in one direction um, and it's important for breweries to recognize that and decide how they're going to serve it. You know, it, it could be a beer style. It, and now we're being forced to, to just take a look at what's a consumer preference, what's going to make them prefer to want to come and spend some money here. And how am I going to address that? How am I going to get to them? Um, it, it's part of ongoing business dynamics and yes, they're very unexpected, but um I'm hopeful that our creative group will continue to find ways to engage and be engaging and um, make it work. Yeah. And I think I was just focusing on the flip side of that is as consumers, we may have to update um, our routines to get our favorite breweries beers in our fridge because they may not be open the same number of days of the week. They may not be providing all the services the way they used to. So adapt, figure it out, schedule accordingly, and um, everybody will get through this. So that's a great time to jump into our Brewer's Dozen. Uh, we're continuing our regional second lap around our brewery members. Um, and uh, we've got kind of the uh, uh, middle lower lakeshore here featured. Uh, you want to kick us off and, and tell us why you picked the region? Yeah, and I look at these things and, and go, well, if I was spending a couple days over there or had some time, um, where would I get to? And of course, I don't get to 13 breweries in two days. I, I'm not, I can't do five in a day. It just doesn't work that way for me. Um, but in just in looking at the map and where they're and, and how they're clustered, uh, I selected this lakeshore area. Um, Basically starting at Grand Haven and then and then going up north to um, up north along the shore, you know, not all the way around the peninsula and into the Grand Traverse Bay, but stopping short of that at Frankfurt. And if we start off, uh, it puts us in the, the Grand Haven Spring Lake. Actually, you've got Grand Haven Spring Lake Ferriesburg, the, the Tri-Cities as they call them there. But in Grand Haven, you have Oddside Ales. And you've got Grand Armory Brewing Company. Yeah, and both these operations have grown to be kind of a, a one brewery that's a retail operation and then another brewery that's a small production facility. So 
Um, they're both interesting stories and both operating like that. And then in Spring Lake, which is right across the bridge from Grand Haven, you have Old Boys Brew House, which is longtime member and um, a brew pub operation. So um, fun, but different than Oddside and Grand Armory. Yeah. And Melissa was featured on episode 10 of Michigan's Great Beer State podcast. Uh, then heading over to Muskegon, you've got Unruly Brewing Company. Yep. And also in Muskegon, you have Pigeon Hill Brewing Company. So they both started around the same time, are both fun microbrewery operations that are having some success distributing their beer. And heading a little bit north, you've got Fetch Brewing Company in Whitehall. And if you keep going a little north, uh, one of our newer members is North Grove Brewers in Montague, and they have opened uh, this year during all this um, pandemic craziness. And then in Hart, Michigan, you've got Big Heart Brewing Company. Yeah, I kind of, Big Heart's maybe not as much on the lakeshore as these other places, but it was right there and we were traveling by, so I thought I would uh, scoop them in. You can smell um, the lake from there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you get to Ludington, which is just up the coast, and you've got James Port Brewing Company, which is a longtime brew pub in downtown Ludington. And then you have Ludington Bay Brewing Company. And then traveling a little further north, uh, there's North Channel Brewing Company in Manistee. And you've got Stormcloud Brewing Company in Frankfurt and Rick Schmidt was featured in episode 17 of Michigan's Great Beer State podcast. And indeed, there are two locations in Frankfurt. Uh, they're both cool and fun to visit. Um, one is downtown pub operation. Um, and then the other, they've got a small production facility just outside of downtown. And then we wrap things up, again, getting a little ways away from the lakeshore, but still in the area, um, relatively new brewery, Five Shores Brewing in Beulah, which is not far from Frankfurt. Well, thank you very much. That wraps up this episode's Brewer's Dozen, which leads us our last task for the day is to introduce our guest uh, for this week's interview, which is an interview from the here and now. Uh, and we talked to Mitch, who founded Speciation Artisan Ales with his wife, Whitney. And uh, again, I really enjoyed this interview and I enjoyed uh, little nuggets of their approach, their history, um, and kind of what goes on uh, that I didn't know about before. So um, I found it engaging, and I thought it was a really interesting modern example of of kind of molding, massaging, and shaping the the, the norms of our uh, brewery experience. Yeah, something that I really enjoyed listening to Mitch tell was kind of his venture. He, he knew he had this passion and wanted to do a brewery. And then he went about educating himself, um, probably more uh, in, a, in a more disciplined fashion maybe than, than some folks, but he, he knew he needed to understand some of the business aspects of running a brewery that maybe didn't relate directly to brewing. He wanted to know more about brewing and it actually um, the desire to have a, a model in his mind that was going to be a successful brewery business drove him to focusing on the types of beer he made uh, and I had without really thinking about it thought that it was probably the other way around and that he had you know a real passion for these sour, wild, fermented beers. And, he, and I'm not saying that he doesn't, but I thought maybe that was driving the decisions in the, on the front end. And really it was, it was business decisions and evaluations that I think led him to say that, you know, this fits more into what I'm trying to do better. So I'm gonna focus on these type of beers um, because, it, because it, it makes sense um, from a business perspective and to have experience and passion for it. Yeah, and his commitment to getting himself educated through experience was what exposed him to that discovery and the and the techniques involved with those styles of beers in the first place. So it was a real um, real life example of how that experience helped 
uh, change his path, their path, and and um, provide such an interesting perspective. I also thought it was interesting that I'm going to learn how business works did not result in a business that's pulled out of the manual, that he still created a, a business that was unconventional and atypical and, and required, you know, some, some flexibility. Uh, well, kind of pushing for some flexibility within the system, meaning I think you heard it like it, it sent me back to thinking about the first brewers in the state talking to the MLCC for the first time, like, no, I'm applying for a brewer's license. It exists and I can apply for it. And hear their take on how they were going to, uh, I'll let him share the story with listeners, but how they were going to organize their brewery and collaborate with others. Uh, just harken back to those days of, no, actually, I think I can do it. You're going to need to open the manual. Uh, so I like that his education didn't create a stamped out version of brewery uh, 101. It, uh, it informed him and let him, uh, create something for really brand new. Yeah. And I, th again, I think this is one of the amazing strengths of our industry is that there is this kind of, um, that, you know, there's lots of intelligence and creative creativity and energy and, uh, and, and people love that. I think that's part of why people like to go to breweries is because um, they, they, they get that and they don't have to think about it. It's just fun to go. But I think that's part of what's inspiring um, people to love breweries. And, and I, I think it's a real asset, even before the pandemic, um, the tendency for breweries or the percentage of breweries that close compared to regular, you know, I, I, I'm comparing it to restaurants and they're not, they're not exactly the same. In some cases, they're very much a restaurant. In some cases, they're very much not, but they are hospitality businesses. And, you know, breweries have a greater success rate. And I have to believe that part of it is because of this ingenuity and creativity and the ability to, to think uh, in new ways. And people love that. You know, people who are on the receiving end of it like it. Yep. Uh, so they're very unique, uh, very successful, and they were they were <laughs> inspiring me to to talk about making a plan to go visit your breweries and get stocked up because they were they were using sophisticated creative models of uh, to go only pick up beer long before uh, the rest of the world had to adapt from the pandemic. So with that, uh, we'll listen and learn uh, to Mitch from Speciation Artisan Ales in Comstock Park in Grand Rapids. Here's Mitch. Cheers. Welcome to Michigan's Great Beer State podcast, Mitch. It's great to see you. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. So I'm sure we have a lot to talk about, especially present day with 2020 being a really uh, bizarre year to say the least. But I would love to get started with kind of your beer and brewing story. How did you find yourself uh, in the world of making beer and, and becoming a, a part of the Michigan brewing community? Yeah, it's a, kind of a, I don't know, maybe a more traditional story, I guess, for um, somebody my age, but I started home brewing when I was uh, 21 or maybe 20, somewhere around there. Um, so I just started home brewing with my college roommates. Um, you know, we all lived together and like somebody suggested one day, you know, you can make your own beer. And we were like, no way. <laughs> and so <laughs> we uh, went to Siciliano's and all split uh, just to, like a basic kit. Um, which was a lot of money for us at the time because we were just super poor college students. So, um, but the first batch turned out good and we just decided to, well, good <laughs> is relative, I guess. It was good enough for us. But uh, yeah, we just decided to keep going with it. And so eventually three of the four of us went on to brew in the industry. Um, and then uh, one of them, one of my roommates became a priest. So I'm not sure how that happened, but yeah. Wow. So, uh, where are the other people? What breweries, uh, have received part of the, 
the class of your your home brewing? Uh, so uh, my best friend Andrew, he ended up. Uh, so he also. Uh, um, well, I, I guess I missed a part too. I got a job at O'Connor's Homebrew Supply too. So after oh, okay. after a little bit of brewing at home, uh, that's how I got like into the industry. Um, but uh, my other roommates, uh, Andrew, ended up taking my position at O'Connor's Home Brew Supply when I left. And then after that, he went to the hideout for a little bit. And then he went to Bell's. Uh, and then he went to uh, Bee Nectar and then Urban Rest. And then he left the industry. And then uh, my other roommate, Mike, uh, he worked at Our Brewing and Big Lake Brewing in Holland. All right. So do you recall kind of what the shift was like in terms of you, you kind of brought up, it was good enough to make a second to say, let's do it again. Do you recall anything in particular that started to, uh, you know, whisper uh, professional aspirations into, into the three or four of you and say, maybe we can do this on another level? Pretty much after the first batch. That <laughs> happened. I mean, I, my whole family has got a uh, entrepreneurial, background. Uh, my grandfather started his own business and then my father took over that business for him. Um, and they all have very entrepreneurial mindsets. And so I guess I kind of just viewed it as like that it's inevitable that I'm going to start my own business or, you know, work for the, the family business, one of the two. Um, and after we brewed that first batch of beer, that's where I was like, really like this could become a job like a career that I really like so basically like literally after that first batch we talked about it um so it just we caught the bug we all caught the bug that's great yeah and um and so when or how did the uh, did the kernel of speciation start to uh start to become a thing and and uh how did that start to grow so after, um, after I left O'Connor's Home Brew Supply, I did end up working for my family company for a little bit, for a couple of years. Um, and I was kind of viewing all my jobs as stepping stones to starting the brewery. So I had already decided I want to start a brewery someday, but it's going to be like, you know, eight years out or something like that. Yeah. So, you know, when I got the job at O'Connor's, my end goal eventually was to start a brewery, but that was just like step one, like learn how to run a small business. Mm -hmm. And then I went to my dad's company and, uh, you know, really paid attention about how the business operated, like fundamentally. Um, Cause there's lots of things that all businesses do that, you know, are just behind the scenes. They're an insane amount of work and people don't really see or think about all that. I think a lot of the time brewers are tempted to be like, I'm just going to brew beer. Yeah. And really the reality is that's like 5% of what you're going to do. Like the rest of it is like <laughs> thinking about how you're going to make the beer and then market the beer and sell the beer, and all that. So all of these jobs that I took in my early twenties were basically with the goal in mind of starting a brewery. So after I worked for my dad's company for a couple of years, um, which I did factory automation, I was inside sales. So kind of just like facilitating sales that were coming in um, and running them through our system. Um, so after that, I, um, ended up moving out to Denver, Colorado. I tried really hard to get a job in the beer industry in Michigan. Um, but I think part of my problem was I, I interviewed everywhere, like every, every big brewery and a lot of small breweries. Um, and at all my interviews, I think I was just a little too gung ho about like, I'm going to start a brewery someday. <laughs> But most of the positions I was applying for were like packaging line and like, you know, entry level beer jobs. So I was just like way too gung ho. So I didn't, I, I got a call back at a couple places, you know, for second or third interviews, but never got a job. What um, year are we talking about here? We're talking, we're talking probably about 2011. Yeah, 2011, 2012. Uh, I was really trying to get a job in the industry. Uh, in Michigan. Uh, I basically just gave up. And then uh, my wife had a really hard job and she kind of wanted to uh, leave her job. And she's like, if I'm going to do that, we should really consider just moving out of state for a couple of years to get uh, that experience um, before we have kids and start family. 
And so I was like, oh, that sounds like an opportunity for me to take, you know, to make a career change. Because at that time, Denver was, and still is, totally blowing up with beer. Um, so I was like, I've got to be able to get a job there. So I interviewed, a, my wife moved out and I uh, was applying for jobs like crazy um, and then ended up getting two offers before I moved out. Um, so yeah, it worked out really well. So the place that I got a job at was f called Former Future Brewing Company at the time. Um, they kind of were all across the board. They were like a neighborhood pub, um, but they, they really wanted to focus on sour, wild, and spontaneous beer. Um, so that wasn't mostly what I brewed. I mostly brewed like an English IPA and salted caramel porter and that kind of stuff. Um, but all we talked about all day long while I was working there was sour beer, uh, fermentation, spontaneous fermentation, cool shipping, um, all that barrel aging, all that stuff. So eventually they started a side project called Black Project, um, where it's all spontaneous beer. And uh, I was doing all the brewing from grain to glass at Former Future. Um, so I was, you know, doing the entire process and then bartending at the end of the night. So I'd go in in the morning and brew and then, and then like four o'clock I'd switch over and get behind the bar and bartend. Um, so it was a really intense experience for two years. Um, but I learned an insane amount about just running a business, a brewery specifically. Um, and a really small brewery, which is what I wanted to operate too. So they, they hired me and I started before they even opened. So I was there, you know, when they brewed their very first batches and, um, saw all the turmoil of just what it takes to run a company. Um, and it was a really invaluable experience for me. So while I was there, Whitney, my wife, Whitney and I were going to classes at the library about, you know, very basic business stuff, like writing a business plan and um, that kind of stuff. So really the whole time I was there, we were still like chipping away at this goal of starting a brewery. Um, so eventually we, uh, originally we were like, we want to make like low alcohol beer. Um, Cause nobody in Michigan had really started doing that yet. But we, we like to drink like four and a half percent IPAs and, lots of British beer. And so we were like, let's, let's do that. Nobody else is doing that. We got through the whole process of writing our business plan uh, and got to the end and we we're just like, okay, well, if we want to make session beer, this is going to be at least a half million dollars, probably more like a million dollars investment. And we're like, um, we don't have that money. <laughs> so after revising our plan many, many times, uh, Whitney suggested, why don't we just start a sour brewery like you've basically done it at former feature with their help um the startup cost is very low because you don't need your own brew house you don't need a tap room um so as soon as she suggested that and i started writing some cash flow analysis and a business plan around that um that's when we realized oh we can actually start a brewery a fully functioning brewery for like 50 or sixty thousand dollars so as soon as we did that, as soon as we realized that, um, things really went into motion really quickly. So I moved to Denver um, late 2013, and then we moved back from Denver to Grand Rapids um, late 2015. So we spent two years in, in Denver and then incorporated the business here in January of 2016. Wow, it's an exciting path. It was wild. <laughs> So, and there's a, there's a big shift there in terms of vision, in terms of what um, seems like the small business entrepreneurial side was a steady, was a constant, but yeah. um, what the cornerstone of what you were making uh, had a big change there. Can you tell me about um, that, that kind of last turn in terms of it becoming real and what it was like to get open and, and start making the beers and a little bit about, well, let's just start there. <laughs> uh, try to add yeah, one question was, at a time. It was probably one of the most exciting and terrifying periods of my life, um, late 2016, uh, early 2017. So I spent all of 2016, um, you know, filling out all the applications. I spent a good five months full time just trying to find a location. Um, 
So yeah, from January until May, my full-time job every single day was driving around Grand Rapids um, and greater Grand Rapids looking for a location. Um, and I found our spot in five months, but I know lots of my other friends that have opened breweries say they look for years. Mm -hmm. um, so we eventually just decided on Comstock Park because it was um, affordable and um, like, I mean, a quarter of the price of anywhere in Grand Rapids, basically. And we knew we didn't need a tap room right off the bat, or we hoped we wouldn't need a tap room right off the bat. So Comstock Park just worked for us. Um, but so that was, we signed our lease in May 2016. And then we were open. We did our first release by January 2017. So the whole process went very fast. Um, that was one of the benefits of having, um, you know, not having a brew house, not having a tap room, not really having a big build out. Uh, it allowed us to move very quickly in comparison to lots of other breweries. Um, so basically what I did was I just bought um, some, or I rented some stainless steel IBC tanks. They're 350 gallons uh, and they have a big manway on the top. So I just built up relationships with a couple breweries around town, Harmony Brewing Company uh, and City Built Brewing Company. And uh, they would brew our beer to our specifications and pump it out into our tank and we drive it back to our location unload it and uh ferment so it's pretty like it's very exciting because i thought about it a lot but never actually executed on it um so it was really exciting to do it but i also remember having six tanks in there right before we even opened all full of beer and i was like what if these aren't good like we just <laughs> it's like we just spent thousands of dollars on these six tanks uh, yeah. of, of work. Maybe I should have just done one to see if it worked. Uh, <laughs> the moment of truth. Yeah, but luckily, I think five of the six were, were spot on. So, Can you tell me uh, or tell listeners a little bit about the, the logistics around that? So there's some licensing. There's some, you know, I think taking the brew house out of the equation is an unusual uh, situation and not everybody may understand yeah. uh, how you can do that and also what was necessary to do it from a licensing point of view. Yeah, it was a, it was a little tricky um, just because like licensing people, licensing officials in the state had basically like we tell them what we were doing. They're like, uh, we don't know what to do with you. Um, so uh, it was kind of, Basically, I learned this. I learned about this from some breweries out in Colorado. There's one in particular, Casey Brewing and Blending, uh, and then Rare Barrel out in California. Both of those breweries um, contracted work from other breweries around town. And so I knew it was possible, but we just had to figure out, like, licensing wise, how to navigate that. So the biggest problem that we had was with the Department of Agriculture. Um, they they really didn't know what to do with us because they they look at your process and they're like well the first part of your process starts at another location so you obviously need to get a license for yourself for that location but that's not necessarily true because what we ended up deciding i talked to my lawyer and what we ended up deciding was that no that brewery produces the work under their own license it's just like if a, a vineyard is growing grapes and they harvest the grapes and they sell them to the winemaker. Um, it's really no different than that. And so when we explained it like that to the Department of Agriculture, they were like, oh, okay. So you're, really your process starts as soon as you take possession of the unfermented work. And as soon as we could establish that, everything was smooth sailing after that. And by being unfermented, you're not transferring alcohol between exactly. licenses, which would be available in the winery licenses, bond to bond, is. is not available on the brewery side. Which right? is so insane. <laughs> once alcohol becomes a uh, part of that liquid, you would have a closed door in terms of yeah. trying to transfer between licenses. Basically, but, as soon as fermentation occurs. Yeah, right, exactly. So, once there's alcohol in the solution. Yeah, so um, that's really interesting to have unpacked that. And I don't know if anybody, I remember I've been in conversations where that was talked about different times, especially being on the distilling side. 
it's mm-hmm. sort of a technique that is also f- common in distilling um, yeah. where again, they don't have the same regulation. They can ship alcohol bond to bond and they could ship wort or raw ingredients. So you had to kind of convince Michigan regulators or uh, Department of Ag that this is a raw, this is an ingredient transfer, well, not an alcohol transfer. This is transfer. where our process starts essentially. Yeah. And, then, and then we brew the beer by creating the alcohol. And so how long did that take? Um, I mean, in my mind, I feel like it took like years, but <laughs> uh, just because it's so difficult to talk to uh, people in that position because they are just so, a lot of the time they're just very by the book. And when they have something that's outside of the box, like kind of thrown at them, they don't really know what to do. Yeah. So I think that the, the, the Department of Agriculture thing was probably about a two or three month process of like, Wow. at least one or two days a week, like sitting down and talking to them about what we were doing and creating spreadsheets and flow charts and <laughs> modifying our, our, you know, yeah. plans, that kind of thing. Well, it's funny. It kind of harkens back a little bit to, uh, um, it's interesting to see this happening with a younger brewery in 2016, 2017, when it reminds me of the stories like real ale company in the eighties and, and bells and, and then uh-huh. going on to the brew pub and, and micro licenses that came out in 93 and 94 yeah. because uh, that whole storyline was about nobody had seen a license application for brewing in 40 years. So like, well, do with this. we're not going to know what to do with you. And then when, when brewers started having tasting rooms, there was all along the way, the growth of the brewery sort of species uh, to borrow yeah. on your, on your riff. There's been this, uh, okay, we gotta, we got to sort of either redraw the box or figure out how you fit in it. And I, I feel like entrepreneurs in the brewing scene have, have encouraged redrawing the boxes over three decades. And it's just amazing yeah. in 2017 to hear, oh, we're still, we're still <laughs> doing it. I love somehow. it. Yeah, somehow there's still boxes that need to be fixed. But. I love it. So um, you got that done and you, the, beer um started fermenting and then what's your next step uh well i guess for us we wanted to um make a beer that we could sell quickly um because you know we started on a very very tight budget i think we ended up having about sixty thousand dollars so uh come january we were like okay uh we need to release a beer now Otherwise, uh, we will literally be negative <laughs> with negative dollars, many negative dollars. Um, so uh, our first beer was a open fermented uh, wild Saison. Um, and we dry hopped it at about two pounds per barrel, one pound per barrel of um, like a new world hop, and then one pound per barrel of old world hops. Um, so it's pretty hoppy, fresh, um, but still included Britannomyces and, you know, Saison yeast. Um, so we knew that we could turn that beer very fast without compromising quality because we mashed in super low. We fermented it totally bone dry. So we knew, like, if it tastes good after fermentation and everything, it's good. It's good to release. So the biggest part of the problem for us was that we brewed our first batch early December. And we needed to release the beer mid-January. So it's basically six weeks from brew to release, which now for me is like, I can't even comprehend that because all of our beer ages for so long now. But um, back then we, we knew we could do it because I, I had done test batches at home. So I, I knew that it was possible. But the biggest problem was we bottle conditioned everything. So I feel very strongly that mixed fermented beer needs to be bottle conditioned to clean out a lot of the weird off flavors that can happen from wild, using wild yeast and bacteria. Um, so we had to bottle it. I think we bottled it like Christmas week or something like that. Uh, I had no idea how many people we needed to help bottle. So we had like nine people in there all, all bottling about, I think we did like 100 cases of this beer uh, in 750 milliliter bottles. Um, so it was just like so frantic because we had never done it before. I'd only seen a couple of videos online on a group called Milk the Funk 
from other like European brewers, like doing it on a very small budget. Um, so we had this like crappy, uh, basically like a trough uh, with some spouts on it. And that's what we used to bottle um, our first bottles of beer. It's a wine, it's a wine filler, really. You, oh, yeah. so you, you put all your beer in, in a tank, you dose it with your priming sugar. We also added uh, champagne yeast at the time of bottling. Um, mix it up really good and then bottle it flat, uh, corked it, and then just stuck it in front of the heater. Um, so, so we were just trying to encourage it to carbonate as fast as we possibly could. Uh, and the war in general, in our experience, the warmer it is while it's bottle conditioning, the faster it's going to clean up all the off flavors like diacetyl, THP, other weird, other weird things too. Yeah. Um, so we just really tried to. When you say warm, what are you, what sort of temperatures are you talking about? Like, I think at that time it was like 74 or something like that. Okay. Um, and if we have problem, like in the winter time, we still will crank the heat up, uh, overnight to just help move things along. Um, but uh, like the first week of January, I had people from all over the industry in Grand Rapids basically blind taste it um, because I wanted to release it, but I didn't really know, you know, I, I liked it, but I wanted to make sure that it was really good. And so I had some home brewers that I really respected taste it. And then I had some professional brewers uh, taste it as well everybody gave it the thumbs up and so at that point we were like all right it's time so the way we released our beer for the first two years almost was through a monthly release system so people reserved their bottles online and then um basically they had it reserved and so all they had to do is come and pick it up on the designated pickup day which is always the second saturday of the month so it was that, 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 that was it. I just put it out there on our Facebook page and our Instagram, you know, we're doing our first release. Uh, it's sold out really fast, um, which shocked all of us. We didn't really know what to expect because we were selling 750 milliliter bottles of Cezanne for $15, which at that time was very expensive, you know? Um, so, uh, it sold out really quickly and shocked us, but it was like, the best thing that happened because we had money again. Mm -hmm. So at that time we were completely debt free. And so we're like, anytime we get an injection of cash like that, we're like, all right, let's make more beer. And so we just like pumped all that money back into making new blends. And so from there, it started with just the one brand and then the releases just grew and grew over the next like year and a half, basically. And that to me sounds like, you know, another sort of uh, reimagination of a business model in terms of, can you tell me kind of the elements that um, I hear like, like different pieces of different sort of methods that were going on at the time, but how did you come to that idea of doing a release day and, and, um, and even, you know, sort of your pricing and like what created that uh, model or method in your mind and what made you think it was going to work? I didn't know if it would work, but I was hoping it would. Uh, but being in Denver, I had uh, a lot of exposure to breweries who are, were doing releases like that already. Um, so the brewery that I worked at, Former Future, and then Black Project was their the side project. Um, they were doing monthly or bi-monthly releases. Um, they didn't have people reserve bottles online. They just said, all right, today's the release day. Show up at, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning or whatever. So I'd seen breweries out there do releases similar to that. And then uh, going back to Casey Brewing and Blending, um, they were the ones that inspired us to not have a brew house. They also operated on a ticketed monthly release. Um, so we knew it was possible there. And we knew that Colorado uh, or Denver in specific was a little bit ahead of like beer trends at the time than Michigan was. And so we were just like, well, let's just bring those ideas to Michigan. And uh, it's working here. So hopefully, it will translate or actually hopefully even better yet, we'll be ahead of the curve, you know, before everybody else starts doing releases this way. So um, we didn't know it would work. Uh, I had a lot of people tell me I would go out of business. Um, interestingly enough, some of those people who told me that we were going out of business ended up going out of business themselves. 
um, their biggest complaint about our method of doing business was that um, we didn't have a tap room um, and we didn't have food, which, you know, being out in Colorado, basically no breweries have food there. Um, so for me, it was like almost weird to come back to Michigan and be like, why do all these breweries have food? They don't know what the hell they're doing with, like, these aren't restaurateurs, they're just brewers. So for me, I was like, why don't we just focus on the beer? So that's, that's what we did. And it was, we didn't know if it would be successful for sure. Um, it could have just crashed and burned if people weren't willing to pay $15 a bottle or show up on one day out of the month to get their bottles. But um, we, we had kind of cultivated a small group of very excited people, about 150 people um, through our bottle club. And so I think, the tw you know, amongst those people, they bought almost everything we made in the first year. So that really, that core group of people really helped us uh, succeed through that first year. So and then I'm pricing. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds, um, well, it's just really interesting sort of point in time in the history of things. And I'm wondering, I've got a couple of questions going different directions. One of them is, so where did it go from there? So how, what's changed over the years and how did, how did that early success uh, roll on? Did you continue to sell out batches after batch? And like, what changes have you made since then? Uh, many, many, many changes. <laughs> uh, just, I think a lot of it was just like, well, what do we do next? You know? So it's like, we've done it this way for a year and a half. What are we going to do next? Um, so we ended up opening a tap room, um, mostly because we were in an industrial suite, 3000 square foot industrial suite for the first year. Um, but right next to that industrial suite, like connected to it was a 2000 square foot space. And, uh, it was empty. There's a guy in there using it as like an office or just a man cave. And so we basically just asked him like, Hey, we need more space for barrels. Can you move out? <laughs> and uh, luckily he was like, sure, I can work from home or whatever. So um, we convinced him to move out. We leased that space mostly for barrel storage, but then we were like, we don't need all of this for barrel storage. So maybe we should just open a tap room in there too. So we ended up uh, building out a very rustic, um, basically handmade tap room. Uh, my employees built the bar themselves. Um, basically everything in there was done, done by us on the cheap. Um, and then we opened that tap room in late, uh, 2018. Um, and still our bottle releases were far, far beyond our tap room sales. Um, so that was still our primary mode of income. Um, you know, even after we opened the tap room, but the biggest thing that we were hearing from customers, especially as we grew in popularity, the biggest thing that we heard was, well, I'm in town for on a beer vacation, uh, you know, going to Vivant and Founders, but I can't go to Speciation. And so eventually we were just like, okay, well, we should probably just be open on a more, you know, regular basis so that visitors can experience our beer. Um, so that was kind of the mindset behind the tap room. Um, and there's a, some drama there too, because our landlord was just, he's, he shouldn't have signed us in the first place because he's very, um, anti-alcohol, I guess, but he knew we were <laughs> opening a brewery. So he kind of was putting roadblock after roadblock after roadblock in our, in our place to open this tap room. And it was really driving us crazy. So after about a year of operating our, our tap room there, we were like, we should really think about leaving. Like we should think about, even though we've put all this money and like work into this space, uh, we don't feel comfortable giving this guy money anymore. So um, at that point, that was about a year into having a tap room. We were like, all right, let's shift gears again. And so we started looking for a tap room in Grand Rapids proper. Uh, we were starting to see specialty beer releases wane a little bit. Um, not just us, but across the board, um, pretty much everybody was having, you know, we were all getting used to making all of our money on that one release day a month uh, for about two years. And we, we were seeing that start to tick down across the industry. And so that was a big part of our decision to make the move to Grand Rapids. 
So we ended up finding a space on Wealthy Street um, in Grand Rapids, which is about three blocks away from Brewery Vivant. Um, and it's like a hundred year old auto shop, uh, actually a hundred years old this, this year. Um, so it just felt perfect to, I don't know, open up a brand new tap room in the city of GR proper. But that was kind of our, our transition. Yeah. And now we're going through another transition. So it's like, yeah, with the pandemic and everything. Absolutely. And, um, and when did that open? Uh, the tap room opened late July of this year. And then production stayed in the original building? Yes. Yeah, so production, for the most part, stayed in the original building. Um, we do have production at Wealthy, and we're planning on producing a lot more at Wealthy. Um, but when we opened, we were just like, we just have to open the tap room. Like, we can't yeah. really think about, we can't really think about production or anything like that so basically we just filled a bunch of tanks and barrels over there we're like we're just going to stick them over there and we're going to think about how how we want to do this over the next year or something like that yeah so we haven't really done a ton of production there we've done a lot of fermentation there but um, we have a fooder there and about 18 oak barrels Um, but next year we will definitely move a lot of our production to to that tapper yeah so uh, a couple questions. One is, tell me about your distribution story. Like, so initially, it sounds like the w- way to get speciation was to show up on the on the release day. At mm-hmm. what point, prior to the tasting room, were there other opportunities for people to get your beer? Um, so we did very limited distribution through um, M4. Uh, they're based in Ann Arbor. Um, we start. I can't remember when we started working with them, but I met. I had met Mike. Um, at the Summer Beer Fest of 2016. Um, I was just talking to one of my friends and Mike walked by and happened to pick up on this conversation I was having. And he's like, I want to talk to you. <laughs> and so, so basically from that point on, Mike and I hit it off right away. Um, he was distributing like uh, Shelton Brothers Portfolio and Cantillon, Dre Fontaine and that kind of stuff. And so I think in his mind, he was like, I want the Michigan version of that in my portfolio. So we started doing pretty limited self-distribution around just Grand Rapids, like the specialty shops in GR. And then that was probably like mid 2017, right after we had opened. Um, Basically, we were hearing that people, not everybody was able to make it to the release day. And so... Yeah. Um, we kind of just carved off a slice of our releases and we're like, okay, this, this chunk is going to shops in GR. Yeah. So, and then again, as part of your model, you don't have to staff your shop every day for that. Yeah. Oh, out saved. there waiting for people. So it saves so much money connecting to the retail trade. Seems like it helped you mm-hmm. continue your, your, your blowfish model of, of, uh, you know, being a little bigger than, um, than you really were. Yeah, <laughs> that's what sure. it's called. It is, anyways, it is true. It is one hundred percent true. Um, yeah, so it's it. It all happened really fast. Like mid twenty seventeen, we started sending some bottles through M four, and then by late twenty seventeen, we were getting requests from Europe for for product. Um, and then by early twenty eighteen, we were sending regular pallets, uh, basically all over the world. Um, yeah. so within that span of a year, we were all over the place. Now, have you added, awesome. have you added a brew house to your, uh, production? Uh, we have not. No. So you're conti- you have continued that model of, uh, transferring work from other breweries. Yeah. I, I still, for the life of me, can't figure out why more breweries aren't doing that because when you look at a brewery, any brewery, you just go to any brewery that's not founders and look at their brew house anytime it's probably not being used and how much space does it take up? And so it's like, yeah, it it literally generates money for you, but think about all the unused brew houses around the whole, you know, state. There's a lot of brewing capacity there. Um, So why not, why not pay them basically to produce for you? Um, It's easy for me to say, because we're doing it. Um, but it, it makes a lot of sense for somebody that wants to start a brewery. That's not, you know, these are weird times to start a brewery. Yeah. And that's one way that you can really make it more safe to, yeah. to, 
start something like this. And similar to the old stories, uh, you know, now the Department of Ag has actually heard of it because uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you've been through yeah. and trained them, trained them yeah, all up. Yeah, honestly, it's, I'm, I'm an open book too. So it's like, it, I've had people ask me like for advice, like, hey, I'm thinking about starting a brewery. Can you just like yeah. give me a quick rundown of things that I might encounter? So yeah, I've definitely yeah. talked to some other people that are thinking about doing it and that kind of thing. And it's different than contract brewing because and what just came up for me as the as a benefit to the relationship not to mention the the brewer that's producing the work for you is that it's over that day like it's done it's out of their building transaction complete there isn't the the sort of maintenance and babysitting and managing a fermentation and finished product even it's like you i imagine have gotten good at drawing up the specs and being having both sides understand the target oh yeah probably I mean, ambiguous at the beginning and now i imagine exactly. for anybody that's been doing it with you for a while it's like it's all worked out yeah and you got but i can see the advantage of like it's done you know yeah. um it's brewed and it's out the door yeah i mean we've we've worked with uh all kinds of breweries literally all around the state and even outside of the state um there's been there's a brewery in new york that brewed, worked for us so um, primarily it's like 90% of our work comes from city built, uh, here in Grand Rapids. So we have a really good relationship with, uh, Ed and Rob. Um, and they, they know what I'm looking for. They, they know our recipes basically by heart because a lot of our, almost all of our beers are the same recipe, um, just brewed over and over again. So they, they, at this point, there's very little communication that even needs to happen. Um, we just drop off our grain and they're like, all right, we'll see you tomorrow afternoon. When the beer's yeah. done, or when the work's done, um, so yeah, that's that's we definitely streamlined it with them. Uh, we do have a program called the Laurentian series where we we go to breweries that are kind of close to each of the Great Lakes, um, have a brewery brew work for us, pump it into our cool ship, and then we leave it outside near the lake to pick up wild yeast and bacteria from the air. Um, so we've worked with probably about nine or ten. Yeah, probably like 10 breweries on, on that program. Um, so, and every time we've brewed that a Laurentian beer, it's been with a different brewery. So oh. um, that, that's always a little logistically challenging because uh, you show up and they're like, oh, well, our brew house is on the opposite side of the building and there's no way to get it out to your trailer from there. So um, sometimes we've had to pump like 150 feet from the, mm-hmm. from the kettle all the way out to our tank. Um, but you know, we've learned from that and now we just bring really long hoses with us wherever we go. So there you go. Yeah. That seems like a good time to segue into a community, especially the Michigan community. Um, I don't know exactly where the question lives other than I'd love to hear your take on maybe how your sense, what your sense is of the Michigan brewing community and how that either influenced, uh, your creating speciation or how it's influenced uh your existence i think you're a really unique study in it in that you have this uh continuing interaction uh with other breweries so what are the hallmarks of michigan scene that uh, have contributed to your project well i think one of the main reasons why we wanted to move back to michigan to open our brewery in particular is um we knew it had a very strong cohesive scene so super active uh, owners and breweries and consumers all connecting with each other. Um, And that is actually pretty rare uh, to have that anywhere else. Um, So that was one of the main drivers of what we wanted to do. You know, we wanted to be the kind of brewery that collaborates often because that's how you learn and that's how you can make changes, positive changes. and just it's a good experience it brings everybody that's the whole point of beer in the first place is it brings people together and so um yeah i guess knowing that it had a very strong brewing community is what brought us back here to do this in the first place um so obviously things change it's hard to be a community right now in the middle of the pandemic yeah Uh, but uh i'm on the board of the beer city brewers guild and s- despite everything going on, we're still meeting and we're still coming up with ideas to bring people together safely. 
Um, so we did an event here in GR called Gill Prize, which is kind of like a beer, I guess kind of a beer themed take on Art Prize, which happens in Grand Rapids. And uh, essentially we, each brewery paired up with an artist or a couple artists and they displayed art at their tap room. Um, and people could vote on the art. And uh, it was just like a really fun thing to do to keep everybody kind of connected in a really weird time. So we're still trying, we're still trying, trudging through everything, but yeah, uh, it'll, it'll be nice when this is done someday. Yeah, it's uh, interesting and challenging times for sure. Yeah. And um, mentioning the Beer City Brewers Guild, maybe, you know, I was going to segue into your first awareness or understanding of the Michigan Brewers Guild and, and kind of how you think it has, uh, what role you think it's played in the Michigan beer community. But I think I'd love to hear also maybe first about Beer City Brewers Guild and how does that differ or interact and, and maybe give especially consumers an idea of what are the purpose of these organizations and why is there a Beer City Guild in addition to the Michigan Brewers Guild? That is a really good question. So for us, when we formed the guild, um, we had one central goal, which is to literally just get people excited to come to Grand Rapids and drink beer. Um, so when that is your only goal, um, the rest of the stuff kind of falls away and you can just focus on like, what fun things can we do to get people excited about our local beer? Yeah. And so there's eight of us on the board now, and that is what you know, we meet at least once a month, sometimes twice. And that is what we talk about. Um, so you can kind of forget all the drama that comes along with some bigger, like, um, guilds like the Michigan Brewers Guild and all other guilds that, you know, they have so many arms and facets and they're representing a very diverse group of people. Uh, and there's lots of goals for our tiny little city guild or we have one goal. And so it's really easy to kind of come together and just work on that very simple thing of like, let's get people excited about what we're doing essentially and keep people excited about what, what we're doing. So we, we did a festival and it was uh, great. That was uh, 2019, I think. <laughs> it's hard to even think about. A lifetime ago. <laughs> yeah, seriously. It went really, really well for a first In the time before festival. days. The before days. Yeah, the before. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's like, you know, we don't want to be a festival guild, but we do think that festivals are an important part of like building culture and community. So um, we're trying to like try some different things like Ale Prize and that kind of stuff uh, just to keep things going. So yeah, it's, it's, it's basically, a, I don't know, a cheerleader for Grand Rapids area. Yeah. Beer. I love it. Um, and that's it. And do you recall your first interaction with the Michigan Brewers Guild and, and how's that relationship grown over the years? Oh, probably just going to Winter Beer Fest here in Grand Rapids. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's probably my first interaction with the Guild. I, I didn't really know anything about what it did or anything like that until I started the brewery. Um, but yeah, I mean, its role in creating and cultivating the beer culture here in Michigan was super important. I mean, I think that that was one of the main drivers of, of the culture here and what made it so good is, uh, the festivals and just the sense of like bringing people together across the board for one goal of, you know, promoting Michigan beer too. Yeah. And you did it again with your story about beer city guild. It just sent me back to the early days where I could remember that was, that was essentially the the call for unity at the be at the, the pre guild meetings of the Michigan Brewers Guild. We, okay. We have one thing in common. Yeah. We, we want to see more Michigan beer made and sold and, yeah, and we and we started with that very singular purpose, which led us right to festival, and mm -hmm. uh, and then it, as you mentioned accurately, it grew to be more complex, yeah. and organizations grown with that. But it, it started from that very simple, uh, very simple idea of bringing people together and and building awareness. So mm -hmm. I love seeing the younger breweries and now younger guilds not just younger because their number of years, but as our subsets change and as the community yeah. grows, there becomes these other uh, versions. And I, I love hearing that story and realizing that we're still getting inspired by, by some of the core ideas. Uh, yeah, for sure. 
with new results, but the core ideas of bringing people together, mm -hmm. uh, showcasing a love for beer and community. And it's just awesome to see where mm -hmm. it continues to have offshoots. Definitely. Uh, so I think that's a good time to head into the, the Great Beer State Last Call questions. This is a group of questions we're asking everybody uh, on these interviews. And the, the first one's a bit of a doozy in that it's what we haven't really talked about yet other than a few references is the pandemic. So uh, it's really been a, a, an unbelievable year in a lot of ways. And the question is just how is COVID-19 and all the related regulations, how has it affected your business and how has it affected your outlook looking forward? Yeah, it's definitely changed um, everything, I think, for everybody. And our business is no exception. Um, I remember taking a survey. I can't remember who. It might have been Michigan Brewers Guild or some, some or may, it might have been the Brewers Association. But I remember taking a survey in like early April saying like, how many months do you think your business is going to survive at the current rate? And I was like, well, shit, like <laughs> three. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, obviously been more than three months and we're still around. Um, I actually just looked at our numbers uh, yesterday because I was like too scared to even look at our overall sales and, and compare it to last year. Um, and it is lower, but honestly, we've been able to pay our bills and we're staying afloat, which is, um, and we feel, we feel pretty stable, uh, as well. So I think, uh, getting an emergency, uh, disaster loan, um, made a massive difference for us, um, because we basically just put it in a bank account and we're like, when things get really, really tight, we will pull from this and not worry about, you know, the ramifications of it because it's in the grand scheme of things, it's $150,000. It's not an insane amount of money. Um, so that, that alone has really, um, saved us, I think, and probably a lot of businesses. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the reason why we feel pretty stable and comfortable going into the winter, despite, I think, how crazy this winter is going to get. Um, we know we'll be able to survive through the winter and I'm very hopeful to, ne to next summer. Uh, even if social distancing is still in place, I think that we will, um, still be okay. We'll still be able to stay afloat. So I think I might have a little bit more of an optimistic view of it. I don't know why, because I'm a very negative person, but uh, I don't know. I'm feeling, I'm feeling like we're, we're going to survive it. So, well, in terms of business models, you know, your, um, your decisions weren't typical in terms of, I think a lot of people believed they needed a tasting room first. They needed that uh, glass that pint glass over the bar retail sale which would then oftentimes encourage food and and all and i think those are all sound decisions oh yeah but, but you know you've got some skill sets here in um picking up your beer and and heading home that really you, played well into our strategy you've been doing that pre-pandemic so that you have muscles there i imagine that can um can weather this sort of storm yeah. in a different way that made a big difference. Um, I, I remember saying that a lot in the early days of the pandemic. Like, it's a good thing that we have a core group of customers that buy our product for, you know, one day, one day a month, basically. Yeah. And even having the methods in the lanes. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we already that. had them developed. They did Where, change. Right. But, but I'm just saying your customers aren't going to get confused when you say, here's how to go. It's going to work. Yep. Yep, it's just like you've been doing that for it's baked into our business for the life of the brewery. Yep. Um, so uh, the next question is the more you know, uh, what beer style do you feel most connected to and what do you wish more people knew about it? I, I, well, I can't, I can't actually drink beer anymore, which is a whole nother thing. Wow. <laughs> but, yeah, that's a whole uh, conversation. It's like hours worth of conversation. Um, but uh, the, the style that really just boggles my mind that it's not more popular is English ales. Um, especially the like low alcohol, um, hand pull cask beers. Um, I think a lot of people, carbonation bothers them um, just with heartburn. And uh, I think a lot of people are also watching calories and that kind of thing. Um, and so British beer, English beer is generally a lot lower alcohol, not super carbonated, 
you can just slam them back there. <laughs> like compared to a lot of our styles of beer that are popular now, a lot lower in uh, calories and um, they're just delicious too, not to mention that's an important part of it. Um, but they're just so complex and such a tiny little like low alcohol package. Um, and so that's, that's something that just uh, really bothers me that it's, ne <laughs> that it's never taken off. And I'm obviously not in the situation to um, do anything about it because I own a sour brewery. Um, but there, there are some like <laughs> cask breweries around the country that are uh, like Hogshead in Denver. And then there's uh, a couple out in California as well that just focus on like cask beer. Um, but it was always a really nice treat um, when I could go to Hogshead in Denver, especially during GABF week, because you'd go there and it would literally everybody there would be brewers or brewery owners. Um, so I think that a lot of brewers really appreciate that style or that category of beer, but it never, for whatever reason, it never caught on in America. Um, but in all of our travels in, in Europe and England, uh, it's just like, that's just what people do. Everybody just, you know, goes to the pub after work, have a pint, go home and eat dinner. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's just been, like good beers baked into their culture like that. And we're working on it here, but obviously there's still a lot of room for uh, improvement. But yeah, long answer to your question, but. That's a good one. So um, your ideal home bar, uh, what is your home bar set up like? And do you have suggestions uh, for people who are now likely serving and enjoying more beer at home? Obviously, your home bar is going to reflect some of your uh, dietary shifts, but uh, <laughs> tips and tricks or thoughts about what your home bar is like. Yeah, so in my home brewing days, um, I had a kegerator um, in my basement with like two or three handles on it, uh, and I was mostly brewing like cream ales and bitters and uh, pale ales and that kind of thing. Uh, so that was like, you know, in my 20s, that was amazing to just have two or three beers on tap in my basement that were low alcohol that I really just could just pound basically. Um, so obviously that's, that has changed too. Uh, I no longer have a kegerator at home because I own a brewery. So it's kind of, it's kind of pointless, but uh, my home bar now um, is pretty much my wine cellar. Uh, so I always have cider on stock. I always have some, red wines, some orange wines, some white wines, and a lot of bubbly wines. Um, bubbly wine is probably uh, my favorite kind of wine to drink. So um, that's what I have the most of here. But it's pretty simple. And then I obviously I have the whole range of spirits um, from local distilleries and then a handful of spirits from bigger distilleries. Yeah, variety sounds like. Uh, yep, and, I really uh, like scotch. Uh, so there it's you just go. expensive. So I try to buy like a bottle and milk it as long as I possibly can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. Um, all right. Love and hate. What current trends do you either love or hate and, uh, how are they reflected or not, uh, in your brewery? Uh, it's, I used to have really big opinions about this. Um, and, I, I've realized being a business owner that, um, Trends are not a bad thing. Um, they happen for a reason, and it's because consumer demand shifts. And if you're not paying attention to that, um, you're probably going to miss out on something. So at first, I was you know, kind of opposed to hazy IPAs for a couple of years. And then I was like, you know what? People like it. What, like, why not? There's nothing that I should have morally against this. Um, so like that was a problem for a while and then I got over it. And then seltzer is obviously the big thing now that you probably, yep. it's probably what everybody answers is seltzer. Um, so we kind of resisted it at first. I wasn't against seltzer ever. Um, it's something that when it started popping up, I would taste one and be like, that's good, but it could be like, it could be better. Like it's just kind of alcoholic water, bubbly water. Um, so after my celiac diagnosis, um, I was like, all right, well, screw it. I can drink seltzer. So let's make a seltzer that I actually want to drink. So um, 
I stopped drinking beer in July of 2019, and then we made our first seltzer in like December of 2019. And uh, we've been making about one a month, just like random fruit and spice combinations. Um, so that's that's a trend that I don't know. We kind of just brought into the to the brewery. It's not something that is sour beer, obviously, but there's a lot of things in common with the way we make seltzer to our sour beer. So it was something that we could actually do um, and make good, in my opinion. And is that a tasting room item or are you also uh, selling that elsewhere? Uh, we usually include it in our releases. Um, and then we have a lot of them in the tasting room. We have like four or five different ones in the tasting room right now. Yeah, gotcha. I was thinking, I imagine that also fits well with your overall, although it's all been challenged by COVID, but your overall shift to welcoming people in your space on the yeah, regular versus release stuff, you're going to, you're going to have, uh, you know, a need for a little more diverse offerings to. Yeah. I think especially being in grand, having a tasting room in Grand Rapids, uh, having some seltzers available and then also having wine available. Um, I don't know if we could have pulled off the tasting room, uh, even one year ago. I don't, I don't think we could have pulled it off because we only had sour beer. Right. And while that is very popular with people in their twenties and thirties that live in that area, um, it's still like we still our number one seller every week is our one IPA. Um, so it's like you got to uh, we didn't ever make a clean, a clean IPA back in the day. But we knew when we opened the tap room, OK, we need to really diversify so that we, you know, have products that everybody walking in will feel comfortable drinking and like drinking. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, I'm not anti-trend as not nearly as much as I used to be. I, from, from a business perspective, I just have to be like okay, well, maybe we'll take a chance on that if it makes sense for our company. Yeah, and you can be selective, which sounds like you are. Find find how it fits and or whether it does. Uh, Do you remember your first drink? Uh, Probably rum and coke with my dad at deer camp. Love it. Yeah. How about your worst drink? My worst drink? Uh, I don't know. I've had a lot of really, really bad drinks. Uh, my worst drink was probably something I brewed. Uh, there was a beer that we brewed really early on. Um, I think it was like early 2017, right after we had opened. Um, and it was supposed to be like a low ABV Saison, like Tark Saison. And it went like something, some kind of bacteria, and it made it like really thick, like syrup. And I, we always taste through all of our conditioning bottles just to check in with them and see what they're, see what they're doing. And I remember like popping the cork and pouring it into a bottle and it's just like glugging out. Oh boy. Like, like maple syrup. I was like, okay, that's a little weird. I've never seen that before. And then I like taste it and it's just like the consistency of snot. Um, oh boy. And that has really. And yet for the sake of science, you, you soldiered on and tasted it anyways. Yeah, I had to. Yeah. <laughs> But it still lives with you. Yeah, yeah, I'll never forget how horrible it was. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, uh, moving on to happier subjects, who uh, do you think would be a good bucket list drinking companion? So somebody alive or dead that you haven't had a beer with, but you'd love to. Um, I don't know. I think uh, I'm a really big uh, soccer fan, uh, Liverpool in particular. So their coach, Jurgen Klopp, would probably be a good one. Or the uh, late, uh, late night host, John Oliver, I think would also be a very interesting drinking companion for a night. Yeah. He's uh, got a lot of big opinions, and he's also a huge fan of Liverpool. <laughs> so. Yeah. All right. Well, Jurgen and John, you're going to need to uh, hook up here with Mitch and uh, have a couple of beverages. So if you're listening, let's put it together. But uh, thanks a lot for – uh, for your work in putting speciation into the world, uh, making all the beautiful beverages for people and for spending time with us here today. Really appreciate you being part of the Michigan brewing and beer community. Thanks. Thanks for interviewing me. Thanks for listening and sharing while supporting Michigan breweries and craft beer everywhere. The Michigan Brewers Guild was formed in 1997 with its first summer beer festival taking place in July of 1998. 
It's now five annual festivals are dedicated exclusively to Michigan beer, brewed by more than 270 member breweries. The Michigan Brewers Guild exists to promote and protect the passionate Michigan beer industry in every way possible. To learn more, visit us at mibeer.com or say hello on one of our social media pages as we love hearing from you. From coast to coast, from far and near, let's drink Michigan beer. Michigan beer.